Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming on this rainy day. Um, this is the very first Startup Stories and Stra Strategies talk of 2017. And we're very pleased to welcome Satish Ramachandran to the school, back to the School of Information. Um, he will be discussing disrupting enterprise computing by using design to completely reimagine how it ought to be. Um, he is the global head of design at Nutanix, where he dedica he's dedicated to applying design to reimagine enterprise computing. And prior to that, he's held a variety of leadership roles at companies like EMC, Cisco, and HP. Um, he has a deep background in engineering, coupled with an interest in literature, music, cognition, human behavior, and philosophy. And that enables him to bridge the worlds of design and engineering effectively. Before we get started, please speak into the mic. Try to hold your questions to the end if you can't, we understand, but um, speak into the mic if you have a question and that way our online audience can hear your question or uh, Satish can also uh, repeat Definitely. back your question, so don't worry too much about it. But <laughs> um, And with that, please help me welcome Satish. Thank you, Satish. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, everybody. It's a pleasure and an honor to be back here again. Um, and uh, Rebecca has done the introduction, so I won't go over any more of that. Um, today, basically, we're going to talk about how to use design to reimagine all of enterprise computing. You know, the whole bit, storage, networking, compute, all of computing, basically, right? We'll also focus on why design is actually the right set of eyes to look at the problem and not looking at it through the lens of technology but looking at it through the lens of design. So my talk is actually structured as three stories. So the first story is the story of the problem and the solution. Um, the second story, given that this is a series on startups and strategies, is going to be a story of the company slash the product, how it evolved. And the third story is the story of the evolution of the of design within Nutanix. Um, how we evolved the design team, what are the challenges. Um, I thought th that will be relevant as well, gi given that you know this is where the this is the design school, and a bunch of you folks, I'm sure, are design students. So, um, right. So, without further ado, let's get started with sort of the first story, which is the story of the problem. So, what is the problem, right? So we've seen this. Um, on the left is the Dynatac, circa 1983, cost $4,000, weighed a kilogram, 10 inches tall, took 10 hours to charge for 30 minutes of talk time. Right? But in its day, it was the king of phones because it was the first mobile phone. Then around 11 years later came the IBM Simon, half the weight, still a pound, and costed $900, and it had a handful of apps like calendaring, email, contacts, and it had a touchscreen display, which was, which was a big deal. Right? And then you're familiar with the evolution of phones, the BlackBerry, which brought a, a few more apps, but not a lot. And then the iPhone, wherein the phone began to disappear into the background. The phone was not really the thing that gave meaning. It was more of a platform. What really gave meaning were the apps that ran on the phone, which enabled you to customize your life. Right? So, on the left, technology is king. And on the right, as technology became more and more commoditized, cheaper, better, user experience became king. Right? So now, this you have seen you know, um, from Don Norman. Um, as technology evolves, there is a certain amount of performance beyond which more performance or quality is quite meaningless. And the focus really needs to go on the user experience. And that's where, really, the value lies, right? So that we have seen with the mobile phone, right? So let's look at computing um, over the years. 
So this is the cost of computing declining annually, 33% over the past few decades. This is the cost of storage declining 38% you know, dollars per gigabyte over the past several years. The cost of bandwidth declining 27% annually. Right? So basically, compute, storage, networking have become commodity, extremely cheap, and ubiquitous. Fair enough. So let's take a look at scale. So this is Warren Hall right here in Berkeley. Right? The amount of computing that sits in Warren Hall is roughly one soccer field worth of equipment. Spread on several floors, so it's not that obvious, but it's one soccer field worth of equipment. Right? So pre, you know, pretty good scale, still small. This is Microsoft in San Antonio six soccer fields worth of gear. A lot of compute, a lot of storage, all hooked up with massive switches, right? And then here is Google in Mays County, Oklahoma, right? They bought an old Gatorade plant and converted it into a massive data center. 15 soccer fields, big. And on the inside, it roughly looks like this. You know, aisles and aisles of racks and racks of equipment all cabled together. You can't even see the door on the other side um, if there is one, right? So basically, the point I'm trying to make is uh, computing has become cheap, ubiquitous, and is deployed at a scale that we have not seen before. And the Google data center is not really the biggest. There's actually a few more. I was just looking up on the web a few days ago, which are bigger than this. The NAPs. Um, are much bigger than this. So basically, cheap, commodity, ubiquitous, and at a crazy scale, right? So let us see what's the architecture, right, uh, with which these things are deployed, right? So typically, you have a layer of virtualization which sits on a layer of compute. So all the CPU and memory using that, you create these virtual machines. Uh, to make better use of uh, the underlying hardware resources. So there's a layer of virtualization. And there's a team that manages all the virtualization and the compute. And they are relatively siloed because they know everything about virtualization, but nothing about anything else. And then there's a layer of storage. You have you know, block storage and file storage. And there's a team that understands storage and only storage and nothing else. And there's all the networking guys who know everything about storage area networks and IP networks. And they're really good at all that stuff, but they don't understand anything else. And then there's all the backup and DR um, folks who typically tend to be the storage folks, but a team. Um, and their focus is on backup and DR. And you have a whole bunch of vendors like VMware, EMC, Dell, HP, Brocade, Cisco, all of them putting their gear in there with their own user interfaces, their own user experience, um, and building up the stack. And all of this exists in order to run applications on top. Right? This is all great stuff because virtualization was a landmark in computing. You know, network attached storage was a very big deal in computing. And networking, IP networking itself, you know, it may suddenly change the world completely. So all these were really big deal. But the trouble is, all these layers evolved horizontally. So you made progress horizontally in storage and networking and virtualization and backup, everything, right? But the applications consume the stack vertically, right? And that's that's the key point here. Because the applications need a slice of compute. It needs a slice of storage. It needs some network bandwidth, because many times there are multiple processes that comprise the application that need to talk to each other. So it needs a slice of networking. And uh, they consume it vertically. Yeah, go ahead.
No, I meant uh, the evolution of technology, let's say the technology of compute, it's, it's better to think of it as a horizontal evolution because compute evolved, you know, microprocessors evolved, their densities increased, and virtualization was built on top of compute. And that is a horizontal evolution in a sense. I mean, you're right that, you know, sometimes you have hardware that is optimized for certain databases or something like that. But my point is mainly that the evolution of each of these layers is independent of the other layers. And the teams that specialize in these layers are necessarily siloed. And the consoles they deal with, there's a roughly seven to 10 consoles that make up the stack. And so there's a learning tax that people have to pay in order to manage the stack, which is very significant. And you have roughly, you know, at least four teams here. And each person costs roughly quarter million dollars a year. So it is very human intensive, um, very complex, and you have to figure out all the interoperability and stuff like that uh, between the layers in order to just jigger up this whole stack, right? Um, and also there is the complexity when it comes to deployment. Let's say I want to deploy an application. While talking to customers, what I hear is, if you can do it in three or four weeks, man, that is fast. And in this day and age, that statement is a sin. Because this is the, you know, the days of the public cloud and AWS and stuff like that, where you slide a credit card, spin up a machine, and within 15, 20 minutes, you know, my kid who's 10 years old can spin up a machine on Amazon. And it's so, really, it's so easy to use, right? So weeks is, is terrible. And given that you have to, if your application has a problem and you want to debug it, now you have to, all these teams have to necessarily talk to each other to figure out is it a compute problem, is it a storage problem, is it a networking problem that the application is facing, let's say it's slow, so we don't know the cause of slowness. And they don't necessarily speak the same language because the compute guy knows only compute, the storage guy knows only storage. They don't necessarily speak the same language, so it becomes extremely slow, extremely hard. And so this is the mess that is enterprise IT today. Extremely complex, extremely slow, and extremely costly to run and maintain, right? So, and if you imagine this complexity at sort of this scale, you can quite imagine you know, the, how the problem looks, right? So then we are again back to the crossover point because technology is cheap, it's commoditized, and no matter how much more performance you, you put in, while there are applications that might need that performance which will run on bare metal, for a large uh, number of applications really, um, you know, excess performance really is meaningless. Um, for a large number of businesses, excess performance is meaningless because where they're facing the pain is actually in, the, in managing this stack and deploying the stack, deploying applications, doing things quickly, so on and so forth, right? So if we asked a different question, we looked at this problem through a different lens, and we said, okay, to make human consumption of computing simple, what needs to be built? I don't think we would build this six layer cake that we saw, which is extremely complex. I don't think that's what we would build, right? Instead, what we would likely build is we would take all these layers because the functionality is still needed. You need, still need storage, you need compute, you need backup, you need networking. And then you would compress all of that stuff, mush it together such that the functionality is there that you need, but then you come up with a notion of a cluster of nodes which provides you all this functionality with a lot of the complexity abstracted out. So yes, you can spin a virtual machine, you can attach some storage to it, but all the complexity is abstracted out. It's managed through a single pane of glass, not like these seven or 12 consoles that we saw, with a single team. 
and you run applications on top. Essentially, all of computing should become like electricity. It's invisible, it's there in the background. You don't necessarily deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. You deal with your applications because that's what really makes sense, that's what's meaningful. We don't wake up in the morning and get all excited saying that, man, there is electricity, how cool is that? Instead, we you know, plug in the toaster, make a slice of bread or some such thing. You know? um, that's how it is. So infrastructure essentially needs to fall into the background. It still needs to be managed, but it needs to be simplified. Um, whereas you, know, you provide very simple abstractions and you provide a mechanism to grow this infrastructure. You provide a mechanism to scale it such that, okay, if I need two more applications, well, I'll just slide in another couple of nodes and the system you know, now still looks whole with more capacity, right? So that is what one would build, right? So, and when we do that and we ask the question, well, if you do this, what's the impact? And like we talked about, you know, the cost goes low because you don't need several teams, you don't need all the slowness. Your agility increases. And business ag agility these days is the, is the speed at which IT operates. Let's say you're trying to run a marketing campaign um, and you want to run it quickly and you want to figure out which um, geos you want to run the ma marketing campaign. And you want to develop an application, you want to deploy an application and mine some data which will give you that information. If you're gonna take three or four weeks to actually deploy that application and get the data, the window of opportunity would have long disappeared, right? So the speed of IT dictates the speed of business. So agility becomes extremely important, which means simplicity and speed of operating things um, becomes extremely important. And then there is the whole human angle to the whole thing, right? So um, this is, you know, bunch of tweets we get from you know, customers where people actually get their lives back. They are not struggling to, with their infrastructure, trying to maintain it, trying to provision applications. Suddenly they feel empowered. They get their life back and uh, you know, upgrades in this case. This, uh, this tweet is about upgrades and upgrades are typically anxiety filled uh, times for most people because you don't know if it'll succeed or if it'll fail. Um, so here's a person who's clicked upgrade uh, a Nutanix cluster and has gone to do a barbecue. And uh, people actually bet on technology with respect to their career. Like in the 2000s, there's a bunch of IT admins that bet their lives on virtualization. And that was the right bet and they became, um, their careers in the organization grew as virtualization became more and more ubiquitous, right? So there's a social responsibility when we create technology, right? And then there's some delight, you know, IT administration does not have to be serious, boring, right? And so when we do upgrades, because upgrades take a while, we pop up a game and people play and we get a lot of tweets. Oh, I love it, thank you so much, that kind of a thing. And when, when everything is good, we don't settle for a green checkbox, we throw a monkey with a banana, just to get a smile on people's faces, uh, that kind of a thing, right? So when you do all these things, um, this is how people react in the end. And this is very meaningful to us because I don't know how many people are familiar with the NPS score. Um, essentially, it is a simple question that you ask, how likely are you to recommend this product to your friends or colleagues? On a scale of 10, you answer. I believe if you score somewhere between one through six, um, you're considered a detractor. If you score seven and eight, you are neutral. And if you score nine or a 10, you're a promoter. So this score is the difference between the number of promoters and the number of detractors. And for a large number of companies that I've seen in my career, 25, 35, somewhere around there is considered all right. If you get up to 50, you're a rock star. Um, so 92 is something you know, we guys are very proud of, which means the simplification, the delight, all the stuff that we bring, uh, people like it, it's making a difference to their lives, right? So what is the product story, right? So this is the problem and the solution, and that's the story of the problem and the solution. So what is the story of the product? Um, so we started uh, 
in 2009. I wasn't there as part of the company at the time. Um, three founders uh, you know, started the company. Uh, in a couple of years, in 2011, we got our first customer. Um, it was apparently a $80,000 deal. We were very happy. Um, the first product was out, bunch of bugs in there. So we spent 2012 cleaning up the product and uh, bringing you know, scale out to the mix so you're able to now build scalable clusters and just expand the capacity of clusters as much as you like, right? Then after that, from 2013 onward, uh, things tend to you know, go forward like a rocket ship. So we started getting more and more customers and uh, the revenue continued to increase. So this is the quarters from 2013 um, all the way to 2017, fiscal 2017, um, right? So roughly we are you know, somewhere in the $700 million revenue um, kind of range, which is a nice place to be. And if we look at the product in 2011, and the UI looked like this, you know, skeuomorphic, built in flex, very old school, looks clunky. I'm sure you guys are cringing. Um, and uh, then in 2013, um, we moved to HTML5, so the UI got cleaned up a little more elegant. Uh, then in 2014, April, we hired our first designer. And uh, then we started uh, paying more attention to design consistency. We had a UI toolkit, you know, consistency in buttons, tables, f a proper font that we used um, everywhere, and a color palette, and the whole bit. So we started cleaning up the UI and focusing more and more on the user experience. And um, then in 2014, we built a single pane of glass to manage multiple clusters, which could be scattered across the globe, because most businesses these days are scattered all over the world and the administration happens from a central place. So this was the 2014 UI. And uh, that is, and then from 2014 onward, you know, things have moved on um, quite nicely. And uh, let's look at, you know, how the design team has evolved uh, in the same time, right? So we started with the first designer, like I was saying, in uh, April of 2013. And now we have a dozen designers uh, working out of uh, San Jose. Um, in, and then we hired Irene, um, who used to be the VP of design at Google as an advisor to the company. Um, and she has helped us scale the design team um, over, over this time. And that happened sometime in 2014, mid-2014. And then we started Bangalore um, as well, which was, which I didn't, know if it would be successful or not at the time, but it seemed like the right thing to do. So we hired the first designer in Bangalore in 2016, Jan 2016 to be precise. And now we have six designers in Bangalore, and many of them come from top schools in, you know, in India, um, like the National Institute of Design and IIT Gauhati and uh, places like that. A lot of talent uh, out there um, that has been uh, really awesome. So we now have two design teams uh, here and in uh, Bangalore and a couple of uh, freelancers that we work with scattered in Europe as well, right? So there's uh, basically the point I'm trying to make is there's a lot of focus on design because that is really the lens um, using which we need to continually refine, simplify, and bring about some simplicity, speed, and delight uh, to this problem, right? So along the way, um, we did not have a design process um, so we came up with a design process that we follow when we build features. So you have the standard uh, pro you know, product manager, engineer, and uh, um, design lead working together, trying to figure out the requirements and building an initial rough concept, which we vet with, uh, with the rest of the engineering leads in the, in the company and relevant product managers and such. And once the concept is vetted, we then proceed to build wireframes and uh, higher fidelity mocks and go through a series of iterations. And then eventually we have a design critique um, and we settle down on a high fidelity design and that goes into um, production and people start writing code. And uh, at that point the designers move on to supporting the developers. And then eventually, um, just before we release the product, we put it in front of customers, get some feedback, 
and figure out whether to fix the problems that they see or not or come back in the next iteration and fix it. So it's a streamlined uh, process. Um, it's not fully waterfall, um, although it looks like that there is some amount of overlap um, along the way. And, uh, and the key thing is uh, having the product manager, the designer, and the engineering lead right from the beginning to the end uh, results in a much better product uh, or a much better feature in this case um, because the engineers think about the feasibility, the designers dream up the right experience, and the product managers figure out the market fit uh, of whatever we are building. So you need all three to build a good product. Um, otherwise, it's like a you know three-legged stool minus a few legs, right? Uh, so that is uh, basically the process that we follow. And along the way, we decided to codify you know, design principles. So what started out with no designer to hiring the first designer, you're seeing sort of the evolution. Um, as we scale, you need a little more process, a little more codification of things, right? So we codified on three design principles. Um, I'll speak to them briefly. So the first one is we say we call it intentional. Um, and this is really, really important because when you're taking you know, several layers of a technology stack and all the functionality, and you need you know, a good chunk of that functionality, you can't throw it away, you're trying to simplify it, um, the UI is going to reflect a lot of that functionality. So if you put such a UI in front of a person, the cognitive load is really, really high because you have to remember all the routes through the UI. If I need to create a virtual machine, I have to go here, click there, there's a drop down, then I go here, then a form opens, and then I put in something, I do this. If I need to do analysis, I have to remember route to the analysis page. There's a lot of, there's a lot of cognitive load, right? And especially when you're dealing with, say, hundreds of thousands of entities or millions of entities, you know, finding things, for example, um, becomes extremely hard. You have to search, you have to filter, you have to group, and then you have to act upon these entities. Like simple things like in a, you know, have say a million virtual machines and I want to find all the Windows virtual machines and I want to shoot them down, right? Um, finding all of them and taking that action takes some time. So being, the, what, the purpose of intentional design is that the interface should listen to your intent. So you express your intent. You don't have to go through a procedure to translate your intent into action that you carry out. You just express your intent, and the, the interface should honor that intent and do the job for you, right? Let's say you're, you know, one example where we, for is upgrades, for example. We have these one-click upgrades, we call them. Um, wherein if you have a cluster of 20 nodes and you want to upgrade it, one way is to you know, first find the right software version to upgrade to, which is, so if the current version from here to the new software version, there is a path for you to upgrade, and then you take potentially each node down, move the workload off, upgrade this node, bring it back up, move the workload back. You know, one by one by one, you upgrade all the nodes. Instead, what we do is we just, uh, we look at the version that you have, we tell you what are all the compatible versions, and we, then you click and say upgrade. And the system essentially from that point takes over, it moves workloads, it upgrades each node, moves things back, it does the whole bit for you, right? So this is uh, sort of like self-driving cars. You describe the destination, but you don't drive. The system gets you there, right? Um, it's the same philosophies. The other thing is we have a search and act kind of a thing. It's like a search bar where you just express your intent. If you say alerts, for example, it'll tell you all the alerts that are there on the cluster. If it says, you know, if you ask for capacity, it'll tell you a summary report of the capacity. If you say, you know, shoot VM, VM1 down, it will go ahead and kill that virtual machine. So you just speak your mind and the interface listens to you and carries out your intent. So with scale, this is extremely important. Otherwise, there's no way to conquer scale without an intentional interface. So the second thing is opinionated, which means we have an opinion about what the customer wants. 
So this is the Android versus Apple kind of philosophy, right? So Android gives you the toolkit. You can do whatever you want with it, whereas Apple has a very clear view of, well, you really, this is the experience that you need, and I'm going to try really hard to craft this experience for you. Right, so we believe in uh, you know crafting the right experience was and making the hard calls because many times the design choices are not very clear. We don't know whether it's right or wrong, but we take a stand at that point in time in what we believe in, and if we are wrong, we come back and correct ourselves. But we believe in taking the stand versus throwing both options out there and making the safe bet. Look, we are giving choice, and as if choice was always a good thing, and we've all stood in. Um, aisles and Safeway or some such thing and looked at 800 boxes of cereals and wondered which cereal to buy. Um, right? Imagine the load on the human mind. You know, choice is not exactly the greatest thing in all situations. I'm sorry, yeah, what's the question? Yeah. Like, which feature, like, which way we can... Right, I mean, we do, we do go through some testing. The question for folks on, online essentially is do you test to figure out which choices, right? We do run tests. We do, we do user testing um, on the prototypes itself or on the mocks to figure out which way people So when lean. you say, does it work? So when you're saying that you're opinionated, it's like for the initial design, right? right? But then from there on, you are data-driven and feedback-driven, and you're going to adjust the product accordingly. Correct, yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Sure. So then the last one is delightful, and um, delight is a is a strange thing, actually, um, because the trivial expression of delight is something that makes you smile, that makes you laugh, and all that. And it's good to have, nothing wrong with it, right? But really, delight is solving for an unexpressed need. Even before you've had a chance to express your need, if I solve for that need, that is true delight. Um, so there's a, you know, I'll give you an example. I was doing a talk uh, in Bangalore some time ago, and after the flight, I was in bad shape, had a bad cold and sore throat and everything. Um, and I was looking like something the cat brought in and I was sitting around there for dinner. Um, and uh, I asked the waiter, can I get some hot water? And the waiter turned around and looked at me and said, well, you know what, How would you like some ginger and lime with it? I had not even thought of ginger and lime at that point in time. Right? And uh, it was good to know before I had a chance to express that need, you know, um, that somebody thought about it and actually solved for it. So in uh, interfaces, uh, there are many opportunities uh, to do this. Um, let's say you're trying to move a workload from one cluster to another cluster. Um, you can say, look, I give you a choice of four clusters to move this workload to. And uh, I'll tell you, you know, this is going to cost you $5 an hour. This is going to cost you $20 an hour, et cetera, et cetera. I'll give some relative um, way of grading so that way you make an informed decision. And then I can say I'm done. And that's a reasonable interface, right? But if you look at it from the human angle, uh, right, um, you, the person makes that choice. But after they have put that workload on there, on the new cluster, there's still some amount of anxiety. Whether this workload that I've put on there is going to perform as it used to, whether other workloads that are running on that cluster are affected by the new arrival or not. So there is some amount of anxiety, right? And people tend to come back, look at performance statistics, maybe every hour or two or whatever, and uh, convince themselves that, yeah, this was the right choice. We did well. It's all good, right? So. Now, if you had something that enabled delight, then the system would actually tell the user once the workload had been placed that the system will monitor the performance of the existing workloads and the new workloads and will send you a text or an email or some form of notification that uh, if things went bad or if the person wants, well, tell me every hour that things are good, we'll, we could do that as well. But here, the system is watching out for the human versus the human monitoring the system. So the paradigm actually gets reversed, right? So that enables people to trust machines to make the right decisions, especially once they see the machine making the right decision a few times, then 
they begin to get more confidence um, in that, and then you know it enables a lot of trust and loyalty, right? So that really is delight. Delight is really solving for the unexpressed need, right? And that is really true delight. So then going back, right, to sort of the evolution of the organization, um, you know, job levels and you know many startups, mid-sized companies, there are no specific job levels for designers. So we created a bunch of uh, job levels, you know, which goes all the way from a new college hire to a senior director, that kind of a thing. In mature companies, you see this, but in a lot of other companies, somehow design gets banded in with engineering, and designers are called engineers, which and they tend to cringe when they hear that, um, right? And uh, that kind of a thing, right? So then, the other thing that happened more recently is, you know, sort of is the question of what is the true north for design. If you had to ask one question which helped you make a decision, what would that question be? And the clarity that we got here is that, look, you have to ask the question, will this take me closer to the infrastructure, which is all of computing becoming zero touch, sort of zero human, although we know, you know people are needed, but sort of zero human meaning you know, fewer people able to do more, and zero trouble tickets, right? So that is the true north. So you lean towards the design which takes you closer to this goal, and that helps. Because sometimes the design choices you make are not exactly, you know, very clear. And so this is more of a philosophy which guides us um, day to day, right? So. This is more or less the story of uh, where we are at till now. You know, sort of the problem, the story of the problem, the story of the company slash product, the story of the design team. So, what is next? You know, beyond this, right? So, and this is all. All that we have talked about is in the context of enterprise computing, right? Companies that run massive amounts of infrastructure. Um, so what is next is very interesting, because what you have here, if you look beyond the enterprise, is you have, on one side, you have the private cloud, which is companies and their computing. And those have their own benefits. So you can have you know, service level agreements based on the application, you can craft it. Then it is cheaper if you buy your own equipment and you run it. And then you can pay a lot of attention towards data integrity and you can have enough protection, et cetera, et cetera. Then there's always the compliance angle. You know, some people, especially financials, don't want a lot of their data leaving their premises, right? So there's a bunch of goodness in the what we call the private cloud, which is all the stuff that is there in enterprises, right? Then, on the other hand, you have the public cloud, which is like AWS, you know, Amazon, which has its own goodness, which is it's frictionless. So you pay as you use. It is fast. It is simple. And because it's cloud-based, there's the ability to innovate constantly where you push out software releases every month or every few weeks, what have you, right? So there is bo there are, there's goodness on both sides. On the private cloud side, you have more control, um, and it's cheaper for sure, and you can be more compliant, and you can tailor it according to your needs. On the public side, you have fractional consumption. It's quick, and uh, you know you, innovation on the infrastructure continues at uh, quite a rapid pace, right? So now, all of this, of course, is needed with, in order to run applications, because that's really the end goal of the whole bit, right? Now, the way infrastructure is, is we are forcing customers to make the choice. Look, you run it either on your data center here, or you run it over there in the cloud, and it's really hard to move between these two worlds. Many of you might have heard of Dropbox's uh, famous move from Amazon to their own data center took them six months. Six months to move everything, right? 
And uh, Amazon, I was watching their reInvent uh, um, conference. They brought in an 18-wheeler with a, with a bunch of these containers mounted on them. And they would park it next to your data center. And it had feeds for networking and everything. And they would siphon everything out. And then they would drive it back. And uh, then they would put it on their cloud. So I mean, if you search for, I think it's called Snowball. Um, is the last year's reInvent or this year's reInvent? Uh, uh, not this year. I'm sure it's last year, uh, 2016, um, right? So it's, it's, it, there's a YouTube video there. It's worth watching. So uh, people are forced to make these choices. But that is not right. Because we don't for, live like this, for example. right? If we, if we want to go, let's say, to Hawaii or something like that, we go ahead and rent. If you're going to live in a city temporarily, we lease an apartment or a house or some such thing. right? You rent a hotel. If you're traveling, you lease an apartment if you're not planning on being somewhere for too long. But if you're being, planning on being somewhere for a reasonably longer time, you end up actually owning something. So there are consumption models which allow you to consume, in this case, housing in a variety of ways, right? So the same, we believe that consumption should have these mechanisms, and it should be seamless. It shouldn't matter to you really what your app, where your application runs. But the choices you need to make are, well, you know what? I need something for the short time, and I want it quick, which is the equivalent of a hotel room, in which case we should run it for you in the cloud. Or if you say, well, you know what? There's going to be around for a long time, and I really want to own this thing, in which case, sure, we'll sell you a few boxes, and you plug it in in your data center. And uh, it is cheap, and it's cost effective, and it's the right choice for you. So this gap that is there between the private and the public cloud is an artificial gap that has crept um, the way technology has evolved. And so what we are trying to do is we are building something called the enterprise cloud, which essentially looks at it as an user experience problem, wherein these two things don't exist as two separate worlds, but they are fused. And applications can move seamlessly from here to there and back. And you specify what you want in terms of the cost structure and in terms of the service level that you want. And the system should be able to figure out where best to place it for you. And from a user experience perspective, whether you look at the, the enterprise cloud from on-prem or from a cloud portal, the interface and the experience should look the same, so you're not saddled with a learning tax, wherein you have to learn this and this, but it should look necessarily the same. So this is where we are headed over the next few years. Um, so we started with solving the on-prem problem. Then we realized, OK, well, you know what? Cloud is there, and it looks like this other silo that's out there. So what can we do to really bridge it? And we see that fundamentally as a design problem. Um, so if you look at it from a consumption lens, a lot of things become clear, which enables you to believe uh, to build the right technology to support the consumption model versus building technology for the sake of technology. So, so this is the sort of the future, at least for the next few years, uh, that we are working on. And uh, that is more or less all I had. Um, you can reach me at satish at Nutanix.com, and I'm on Twitter as well. So um, you know, feel free to drop me a note, and we can continue the conversation. Um, so I'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Um, I, uh, um, you talked about the hybrid cloud model um, going from on-prem and uh, public cloud. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of competitors in this space, obviously, with, right. uh, that's been in the game for a while. Um, Microsoft obviously has a huge stake. Sure. Um, IBM has a um, huge stake. You know, everybody has, uh, trying to get their, trying to be in this 
hybrid to p private space. Sure. Um, what makes Nutanix design or your value proposition different from uh, competitors who might have, or, or Amazon, who's also trying to get into this space. Um, what makes Nutanix uh, design or value proposition different from sure. the competitors? I think a couple of things, right? We look at it from a consumption lens very closely. So the trouble that uh, incumbents have, um, and they have you know, a big customer base and everything, but they also have the burden of uh, legacy. And uh, that makes certain choices very hard for them to make. Whereas if you're a startup, uh, you don't have that burden of legacy. So you can stay true to designing the right experience and making the hard calls. So you're right, I mean, there is plenty of competition. Um, and uh, you know, it is a big enough market as well. Um, but our belief is, you know, you have to stay to you have to stay true to building the right experience um, with whatever cost um, you have to pay, um, because we do believe that this is the future, and we are willing to invest it, and we are invest in it, and we are, you know, small enough that we can be quick and uh, we can take our chances. Sometimes uh, when you have when you're big and uh, it's harder to take chances. You tend to get risk averse. Um, as designers, uh, you must obviously have had a request for a lot of requirements that the products that the consumers might have. Uh, in such a case, how do you, as a process, prevent feature creep? So we we are clear about one thing. Uh, there will always be asks on the existing product. You're absolutely right, right? So I want this bell, I want this whistle, that kind of a thing. Um, we take sort of the approach that MP3 took, right? You solve for around 80 to 90% of the problem. Um, you don't solve for 10% um, of the problem because it might be pretty expensive uh, because the choice you have to make at that point is do you innovate further mm. or do you provide this new bell or whistle? So we solve for the 80% and we are okay with, okay, we are not going to get that 20%. Um, that's an okay sacrifice uh, to make. And we are clear in our decision making um, with respect to that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, that's me again. Uh, another question I had, how do you design or how conscious are you in the decision to Ensure because you're abstracting away a lot of you know interactivity and like uh, personalization. And I mean, you know, the person before, like the people before, having access to all different layers. I mean, or different teams manually doing a lot of the different layers. Sure. You're doing that now basically for them, right? Um, so, in how far do you design your system in a way to inhibit people from making mistakes or allowing you not not even I mean, it's like the Apple versus Google or like Apple versus Android approach, sure. right? I mean, I can do some things on my phone that's going to break it on my Android maybe, but not on an, on an iOS phone as much. Do you feel like you're consciously doing things about it that you can't, that like your system becomes unbreakable? Because you were mentioning things like, oh, I can just, you know, shoot this, this virtual machine and then this one and, you know, sure. is it still able, like, are you taking into account ways that people could misuse your system to break something in the Certainly. inner workings of the machine? Certainly, I think, yeah, sure. I think there are a couple of questions actually that you're asking. One is, you know, how do you make sure that there's no misuse? And I think the underlying question that you're asking is also, well, people used to have access to different layers in the system. Now that you've abstracted all this stuff out, uh, is there a loss? I think it sounds like there are two questions, right? So the first one, you know, preventing misuse, we have to do. We have to secure um, our systems, and without a doubt, um, like the federal government is one of our biggest uh, uh, consumers, and they are very security conscious. So we have uh, things like encryption of data at rest and uh, various forms of compliance like STIG that we adhere to um, in order to 
make sh make sure that the data is safe, right? So the second thing is, you know, whether how do you prevent misuse of actions? That is through roles. So if you are when you're a, when you have an account on our system, you're assigned a certain role. Let's say, you know, if you're not trusted, then you will be given some kind of a read-only role, where you can't take any actions. Um, whereas, you know, like a root administrator or a super admin would have the ability to do whatever they want, including setting fire to the cluster, right? Um, so that we enforce using roles. So that prevents misuse, and if you're trusted, well, you're trusted with everything, um, right? And to answer your second question, you know, is there sort of a loss when you take out the various uh, layers of detail when you abstract it out? We don't believe there is a loss, because when you look at it as a, let me give you an example. So if you wanted some storage, let's say, in the old way, um, so there's a computer here that needed some storage from a storage array that is sitting on a network somewhere, you would have to do some configuration, for example, on the storage array to allow this to access the storage. You would have to configure the storage area network in the middle. Right? And then you'd have to configure permissions over there, ACLs, to say, well, you know what? This compute can actually access the storage, and so on. Right? There's all this detail. But at the end, all you're trying to do is take some storage and associate it with, with some compute over here. So what we do is we basically give you the abstraction that says, well, you know what? Here you have, you're creating a virtual machine, and I'm going to just give it storage, and that's all you specify. And we figure out you know, where to get the storage from on our cluster, and we attach it, right? And we also put a lot of emphasis on, uh, you know, analytics, where the machine actually, you know, monitors itself and does the right thing. Let's say a disk fails, for example. The system knows that it needs to replicate all the data um, such to another disk such that there's no single point of failure. So those kinds of mechanisms we build into the system. So the general idea is to take away as much of the headache, so to say, of maintaining the infrastructure away from the user. And that's what leads to safer, simpler abstractions that the user can play with. So a lot more onus rests on the operating system, on the machine. Does that answer your question? Yeah, sure. This isn't really a technical question, but at, sure. uh, during your presentation, you said around 2013 was when you guys first hired your designers? 2014. 2014. Did yeah. you guys notice a sharp or exponential increase in sales or earnings after you hired a professional designer to improve the UX or UI of your product? The, I think we all, the thing is, although the look and feel changed, but uh, the underlying approach has always been to introduce simplicity um, into the whole infrastructure. So I don't think we have done any studies that correlated, uh, well, we hired designers and uh, um, you know, that led to the, a certain increase of some number of dollars of revenue. But the way we have seen it manifest itself is in the NPS score, for example, which is a 92, and all the tweets that we get, which are good representation of customer satisfaction. And if more people are promoting your product because it's easy to use and all, those, all the goodness that comes with it, then other people will be buying your product. So there is a linkage, although it is not as direct as, uh, well, you know, you hired a designer, and therefore, you got uh, x million more dollars per quarter. Um, you know, although we're not able to correlate it at that granularity, um, we do see how it is influencing. Um, every time we talk to our customers, it's very obvious to us that, uh, yeah, this is the right approach. So, yeah, I guess it doesn't have to be x millions of dollars. I guess just any kind of tangible um, result from improving the UX, like whether it's the NPS score that you talked about or anything that's like, OK, from this point on, our customers were that much more satisfied with the feeling of using the product. I don't think we have you know, precise data on that. It's more surrounding data that we have that leads right. to conviction, but not, nothing as precise as what you're looking for. 
talk about the evolution of the company um, and when you when uh, certain hires were made. I was wondering when did you join the company? I joined in uh, I think Jan of 2014. Okay. Roughly three years ago. Okay. So we had a designer on board roughly six or eight months by the time. And uh, yeah, then we built out the design team. Uh, you were showing the, the Don Norman curve of UX and the sweet spot when to stop uh, yeah. doing more design, basically. So it so seems stop like- Stop doing more performance, you mean? Well, it were, yeah, like, wait, I mean, when you say the tech is good enough, right? That's when yeah, you're yeah, spo yeah. supposed to stop building, kind right. of. So you have, well, an extraordinary amount of designers, right? I mean, that's your whole approach. You're like designers doing this differently from a different design perspective. It's a huge selling point for your approach to, uh, you know, reinventing sure. um, computing, basically, right? right. Um, so where do you see your good, good is good enough? Where do you see that spot where the UX is great and the product is great and, you know, working further on it and detailing it further is not gonna, you know, it's just sure. you get beyond this point that you showed us so efficiently before. See, the point there, um, just to be clear, the point on that curve is actually where the technology is good enough, right? And there you have to shift the focus towards the design, right? So I think the question you're asking is, how do you tell when a design is good enough, right? Design, in, I mean, if you talk to any designer, they'll tell you that design is never done, right? So design is never, you know, that you always look back and you always say, okay, well, you know what, I could have designed this much better. So there's a, there's a few ways where we uh, convince ourselves. Um, we actually build some prototypes. We try to walk ourselves through the experience and see, man, is this complex, is this not? We, uh, then we do some user testing and then we figure out, okay, are people reacting to it or are they lost? Um, and then you know, okay, well, you know, it feels too complex or not complex enough. Um, you know, that kind of, or not simple enough in this case, sorry. Um, right? Um, so we convince ourselves in a, in, a, in a few ways. And then at some point in time, you know, just to be honest, there are times where it becomes a trade-off between, uh, you know, technical feasibility um, and also time because you're building a product and you want to get it out in a certain amount of time. So you do take factor that into your decision making. Um, look, you know, we have to go out of this experience. It might be, you know, somewhat suboptimal, but the technology cost is too much, um, you know, for that other 10% of, uh, you know, betterness. Um, so to say, um, or, or we'll come back and uh, redo this in the next version. So there's a variety of ways where we end up making those decisions. Um, but our starting point uh, essentially is let us design the best possible experience. And from there, let us see if we need to cut any corners or not, versus building the technology first and then sticking the user experience on top as an afterthought which is more like lipstick on a pig, um, right? So that kind of a thing. Does it help? Yeah, I think okay. it does. Um, this is not a UX or a design related question, but uh, one of the things that uh, stacked architecture offers, according to me, correct me if I'm wrong, sure, is sure. that it offers uh, flexibility. Say sure. like a system needs some extra memory for a certain time. You can just assign some sure, memory sure. to the to the sure, system. Sure. Um, s something like this is. How do you deal with something like this when sure. you sort of box everything into one particular system? So that's a good question, actually. That's a good question. Um, so a few things, right? So if you go back to, let me just try to pull up the slide uh, really quick. <clears throat> so if you go back to this, um, you see a stack of these Nutanix boxes, right? Um, one thing. I forgot to mention is not all of them are the same model. So from the beginning, we have designed a cluster to be built with different models. So you could have, uh, what I mean by a model is, a model has a certain amount of compute power, um, CPU, and some amount of memory, 
and some amount of storage and some amount of networking connectivity. So we have you know, roughly, I think, eight or 10 models um, with varying ratios of these things. Right? Um, so when you're trying to deploy an application, um, if you know that, well, you know what, this application is very compute intensive, um, then you, you'll buy something that has a lot of compute power and potentially some flash um, if there are storage accesses that you want to optimize for. Or if you know that, well, you know, um, this is very light compute, I just need um, just more storage then you'll buy what we call a compute light or storage heavy node. Mm. So we have, um, but then as a, but in the end it remains as one cluster with a bunch of nodes that you, that are abstracted out, right? And we provide for things like, you know, affinity, wherein you're able to take this, uh, an application and pin it on a particular node if you so want to. Because you know that, okay, well this node has the right compute storage ratio that I'm looking for. So yeah, we do get some, uh, you know, we do get, we have had requests like that, so which is why this thing has evolved the way it has. Um, the other thing I also want to point out is, uh, see in the old days, uh, you know, all these things when, when they were very expensive, um, people worried about getting every bit of performance out of the hardware, because they had paid a lot of money for it. Nowadays that, in nowadays, you know, things being so cheap and everything, people are, you know, willing to spend a few more dollars on the hardware for the simplicity, even if the utilization is not mm -hmm. that great. So you'll, you know, yeah, man, I'll, I'm going to put another four gigs or eight gigs of RAM. It's no big deal. Uh, I'm not going to super optimize. It's not worth my time because my time is more valuable. Mm -hmm. So that's where the sort of, you know, Moore's law and the overall, you know, commoditization of technology has led to a shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Any more questions? Lovely. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.